Good evening, and a very warm welcome to the York Consortium for Conservation and Craftsmanship, and to the second of our spring series of Second Tuesday Talks. I'm Martin Stancliffe, and I'm chairman of the uh, consortium, uh, and I have been for the past um, 10 years or so. We've been running Second Tuesday Talks since the summer of 2020, and we're very pleased to have a wide audience from across the UK and indeed from further afield. We're delighted to welcome many non-members again tonight, so I hope that our regular participants will forgive me for saying a few words about the consortium by way of introduction. The consortium was established over 20 years ago in recognition of York's central role as a hub for conservation and craft skills within the heritage sector. We have built upon this to emphasize the close integration between craftspeople and conservators and to provide a point of focus for both practitioners and those interested in supporting our heritage. The foundation's annual bursary scheme has also flourished and we have awarded over 250 bursaries to support the development of craft and conservation skills. I'm delighted to welcome as our speaker this evening, Harry Wardle. Harry joined Turquoise Mountain in 2009, designing and project managing the delivery of a number of buildings for the Afghan Institute of Arts for Arts and Architecture in Kabul. Following this, he went on to complete a scholarship with the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings when I first met him. And then he worked for the Prince's Regeneration Trust, where he delivered projects, including the multi-award winning regeneration of Middleport Pottery in Stoke-on-Trent. He returned to Turquoise Mountain in 2014 as country director for Myanmar, setting up the project there. Returning from Myanmar at the end of 2019, he has now taken up the role of managing director of the organization. Harry studied engineering at Cambridge University and worked originally as a structural engineer, becoming a chartered member of the Institute of Structural Engineers during his time at Alan Baxter and Associates in London. Harry, it's great to have you with us. F the, the format for this evening will be uh, that um, Harry will give his talk and then we'll have a question and answer session. Um, just before we hand over to Harry, uh, there are just a few housekeeping matters. Uh, we're not anticipating any issues, but if we do in encounter any technical issues, please bear with us. I keep getting notes that my um, uh, connection is unstable, so I may drop out, but uh, it'll carry on even if I do. Uh, you're very welcome to submit questions during the presentation. You can do this by clicking on the Q&A icon, which should appear at the bottom of your screen when you move your cursor there. We anticipate a finish time around quarter past eight, but if there are any outstanding questions then for those who want to stay with us, we'll continue for a few extra minutes to answer these. Now for Harry's talk entitled Turquoise Mountains Work Supporting the Conservation of Built and Artistic Heritage and the Craft Skills Necessary for its Preservation in Afghanistan, Myanmar and Jordan. So, um, Harry, it's wonderful to have you uh, and over to you. Many thanks, Martin. Um, and uh, yeah, great honour to be introduced by you, Martin. As you say, first met you back in 2011. Uh, clambering around St Paul's Cathedral as a, uh, a SPAB scholar. So uh, yeah, great honor to be introduced by yourself, so thank you. Um, and good to see a few people on the uh, um, on the attendees who I know. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen now. Sounds simple. Hopefully it should work. Okay. I'm sharing a screen, so I'm sure I'll get told if people can't see it. Um, so yeah, snappy title, um, but uh, I'm actually borrowed that obviously from uh, uh, the the mission um, of YCCC anyway. And I just thought given the uh, geographical spread, it would be good to relate back what we do really to the core mission um, uh, here. So I thought, um, yeah, quite helpful to, uh, to utilize that. So hence the uh, slightly long-winded title. And, uh, and apologize for that. 
but hopefully you'll see the the relevance um and uh i'll talk a little bit more about this slide uh later but this is uh shukriola who's a uh, highly skilled mason from uh from afghanistan working in uh the medium of earth um and i'm going to talk about our projects across afghanistan myanmar and jordan probably in that order so if i do run over on the first two i might cut short the second uh, the third so apologies in advance for that uh oh appeared to be up there Oh, there we go. So the project with uh, Turquoise Mountain began back in 2006 um, and focused on uh, an area of the old city in Kabul uh, called Moridhani, um, and you're looking at it there, and that's in the, uh, on the, along the Kabul River, and it's an area of the old city uh, built predominantly out of earth um, that was at, like at risk really um, from uh, demolition um, uh, by property, well, yeah for a number of different reasons, really. So Turquoise Mountain then set out to protect and conserve um, that area of the old city in Kabul. And uh, rather unglamorously, it started as all projects uh, or many projects do with uh, clearance. And in this case, clearing about 30 years of rubbish that have built up. So these are images from 2006 and 2007, where we um, started with the, the rubbish clearance and to reveal really what was there, the original streetscape and the buildings. And it also gave an opportunity to offer um, employment to uh, all the, uh, the, the local people of working age. This is the Abul Faisal Shrine before, during and after rubbish clearance. And really, you can sort of see the, uh, the streetscape uh, being revealed, the, the historic streetscape, as well as the buildings themselves. This was a, um, a courtyard within the Great Sarai, which is one of the most important buildings within the complex of uh, of Muradhani. This is a before and an after. And to my, uh, my esteemed uh, fellow SPAB uh, members uh, who are, are joined, um, you can obviously see, I mean, interesting to have discussions around like the sort of the, the restoration conservation kind of debate. Um, I think it's important to note that really when you're dealing with earth buildings, uh, it is an interesting, uh, it is an inter a more interesting debate. And actually, um, in terms of my timing, I did my work uh, in Muradhani before I did my SPAB scholarship. I'll talk a bit about that, a bit about that more in future slides. And this is the main courtyard at the Great Sarai before. So yeah, it was being used as uh, storage for fruit sellers, rubbish, everything. <laughs> and this was after. Um, and this is actually the center um, of the Afghan Institute, for, sorry, the Institute for Afghan Arts and Architecture, which Martin mentioned. Um, in his introduction. And actually this uh, won a UNESCO um, uh, Asia pr uh, Prize in 2011, I believe, um, for, uh, well, for a number of reasons, one of which was um, the, uh, the community center design, as well as obviously the, the conservation works and the training went on. And as well as the buildings, we also concentrated on the, uh, the street shape, uh, reintroducing running water to the, um, to the buildings, as well as a uh, um, sewage system. And yeah, I guess I've shown this slide. This was one of the, um, the projects that I worked on uh, in the early days, so back in 2009. Um, and this is uh, what was called the bride's room. This is um, Shukriola, the mason in the blue hard hat. This is a pretty incredible building um, uh, interior because when we came to it, it was covered in probably, I don't know, about half a, half a centimetre of different layers of paint and none of this detail was revealed. And we just actually carefully started clear, uh, cleaning, the, um, cleaning the, the excess paint down to reveal the kind of decorative mud plaster work beneath and also quite a lot of uh, colour. Um, and to the right of the picture, you can see some inset mirrors as well. And um, I guess to the point, my previous point about the SPAB, so this was before actually I did my scholarship. And we did take a view here to, rather than restore the plaster work because it was in such, um, uh, well, there's so much of its original in its, in, in its original um, condition. We decided to infill the gaps in between with flat work um, to sort of really just keep a simple background and, and not detract from the, uh, the original plaster work. But in some areas elsewhere on the complex, we'd, uh, we'd already sort of infilled some of the gaps and Again, a kind of different approach, um, both with their merits. I think here, because of the, the plaster, which was in such good condition, we decided to, to keep it very much as conserved in situ. 
And these are a couple of other buildings that I worked on quite closely. Um, this is the House of Screens. So the top right of the image is the building during restoration. So one of the side effects of um, Maradhani being uh, um, concealed under quite a lot of rubbish was that um, a lot of the timber frames at the base of the buildings had decayed and the buildings, a lot of them had sunk or in worst case collapsed. So you can see, I don't know if you can see some red car jacks there, but we sort of had to jack up the building. So we had to uh, take a lot, a lot of the load. So remove a lot of the mud uh, from the floors and the, uh, uh, the roofs, jack the buildings up. And then uh, highly skilled carpenters actually use what they call Kashmiri joints, uh, which um, quite complex kind of multi uh, moment connecting joints um, and splice on new sections at the bottom of the columns. Um, and then recarve and then fill in a number of the missing, or well, these windows, which are called Pasai screens, which a number of them were uh, missing, had been uh, burnt for firewood in the past and things like that. Um, and then the bottom left of your picture actually is the reason why it was called the House of Screens, which was this incredible uh, original screen internal to the building, um, which was entirely original and uh, pretty amazing template for a lot of the, um, uh, the restoration that went on throughout the other buildings. Um, another process that we went through perhaps later on in the, uh, in the project uh, with funding actually from the British Council was to uh, record some of the intangible cultural heritage relating to the building. So we recorded a lot of the traditional building techniques. This is Paxter Walling, uh, which is actually probably closely aligned to Cobb uh, construction in the UK. So it's not, it's not rammed earth, it is compacted, hand compacted earth. Um, and you mix up your, your mud, you leave it to mature, and then you uh, basically apply it to the wall in kind of cakes, um, multiple cakes, and the wall goes up in lifts. You can see on the bottom right hand image there, the wall going up in lifts of about 50 centimeters. This is um, what they call Simgel, which is um, the finer mud plaster. So there was two layers of mud plaster normally on the walls. There was a, what they call a cargill, which was a, a straw based quite coarse kind of first layer. And then for the, uh, the finer detail, they put this um, smooth simgal pasta work on, which was a mixture of very refined clay and um, the uh, reed flowers, which gave it some kind of tens um, tensile capacity. Um, you can see there it going on and it produces incredible, very fine finish. And then also the ability to add decorative elements to that. So here's a border going on. And then you can see on the bottom right hand uh, image, a decorative element being placed um, and that they were either hand modeled off um, um, on a bench or sometimes if there was a repetitive element, they would also be pressed on with a wooden mold and then finished by hand. And then this is the, uh, the pate windows that I talked about, um, which are these traditional types of windows with three sliding um, pot panels, solid panels, or sometimes um, and later with glass added in. And this is, uh, yeah, just the sort of the, the, the key elements of that. A lot of these were, so they were made with um, this beautiful Himalayan cedar in the most part, which had a, has a wonderful smell to it. I mean, if you've ever had the, the cedar um, uh, balls in your cupboards to keep the moths away, I mean, the whole of the whole of Morihani smell like that is pretty incredible. And going into the uh, woodworking shops is, is pretty um, atmospheric. And then this was, um, this was back in, in fact, I was, I'm in this photo somewhere, I'm not entirely sure, maybe on the top, I think my head's cut off. Um, uh, that was taken back in 2010, um, probably at the height of the building season, uh, when there were upwards of about 350 people on site, working across probably uh, 10 to 15 active sites across the whole of Murakani. So it's obviously a huge uh, source of employment both in the local community and, and, and wider, um, but also in terms of training as well. And just a little bit more generally on Morodhani, um, there is a uh, healthcare clinic within, the, uh, within the, um, the footprint of the buildings to serve the local community and a primary school. And actually this is a new build that was uh, completed two years ago. And actually here's an image taken last week. I was, uh, um, visiting Kabul last week and this was uh, the school children displaying their works to uh, to mark the uh, well the end of term really and um, they have the new term that starts in now after Nauru's which um, is the end of this month 
But again, this you can see from this kind of a more modern approach in terms of using traditional building techniques but to create more modern spaces. So in this case, a larger assembly hall, but still using the, um, the poplar plant roofing, poplar as in the, the wood uh, beams. Um, and then, yeah, um, in this case, uh, mud brick walls. And then with a timber frame on the, uh, the first floor, which because Kabul is in a, um, a, uh, an earthquake zone, you have this timber framed first floor, similar to other earthquake uh, um, resistant traditional building in the, in the area, including in Pakistan. And then I mentioned the Afghan um, Institute for, sorry, the Institute for Afghan Arts and Architecture. Um, and this is actually a, uh, a wood, uh, well, a, a carpenter who, when we started the project back in 2006, um, was actually selling fruit at the bazaar. Um, and uh, we uh, managed to persuade him to come and teach at the new um, school to teach woodwork. And this is some, some yeah, incredibly fine lattice work that uh, he was an expert in. And other subjects that are taught at the school are um, calligraphy, pottery, jewelry making and wood carving. Um, and I think one thing that we sort of realized quite early on is obviously there was no point in um, teaching uh, uh, students um, all these amazing crafts, but they're not having any um, kind of any jobs for them to go on to. So here is a, um, a commission that we did um, for the Connaught Hotel in, uh, in London, a five star hotel. So basically everything below that rafter level uh, were items made by Turquoise Mansion, so a lot of fine wood carving. Um, and it was mostly done by um, Ustad Nasir, who's here in this shot. Um, also um, with uh, uh, Hadija as well, um, doing quite a lot of the, uh, the wood carving. And in terms of other business uh, related um, opportunities for the crafts, um, this is um, Samira, who's well graduated from the, uh, the Institute. And she actually set up her, a, a, um, a company uh, to produce um, calligraphy more commercially, and they actually she put together a team to put um, to do a, a big commission for um, a, a hotel in Saudi Arabia near Mecca. We've also done commissions with um, Aspreys. These are some um, lapis and onyx boxes, which are made um, in the jewelry department in uh, in Muradhani. And one thing that we got into uh, a few years ago was uh, carpet weaving. So this is Seema, um, she's a carpet weaver, and um, we are working with about, uh, well, there are about a million weavers, carpet weavers in Afghanistan, of which we're working with about 7,000 of them. This is a, a traditional carpet um, displayed in Double Columns Rai, which is one of the buildings within Moradhani. This is a more modern carpet uh, with, in a collaboration with Christopher Farr, who is one of our key collaborators in the carpet, um, on the carpet side of things. And this is kind of a more modern, um, uh, we do quite a modern and traditional carpets. Um, and the uh, Christopher Farr, well, it's actually Matt Bourne, his uh, business partner um, is, uh, is very, uh, well, very supportive of the Afghan carpet weaving industry. He believes that the qualities that they weave are, are, are unique. And then this moves on to a building project that we are hope, hopefully starting this year. Um, this is a carpet shoot that we did at that building. This is up in the um, in Bamiyan in the um, Eastern Highlands, and sorry, in the Central Highlands um, of, of Afghanistan. And this is a 17th century mud caravan sarai, which also makes quite a nice backdrop for photographing carpets. Um, this is a picture of it taken from uh, the air. Um, actually, a, quite a small plane that you have to get uh, to the Bamiyan from Kabul. And this is it. Uh, so it's in the, um, the Bamiyan Valley, which is fam famous. Hang on. Oh, oh. Okay, skip through, sorry. Which is famous, probably most famous for the, um, the Buddhas of Bamiyan, which were infamously destroyed by um, the Taliban in 2001. But it's a pretty incredible um, valley, as you can see there. You can see the, sus the lush green pastures. And it's on the Silk Road, so kind of famous um, for the uh, to be the main trading route for silks from China through to the to Europe. 
pre 15th century. Um, actually put a conservation management plan for this uh, back in uh, September 2020. And actually probably worth noting modeled on a, uh, a conservation management plan that um, James Simpson did for the Secretariat in Yangon. Um, uh, and he knows that I plagiarized his um, structure for that, but it was a very, uh, uh, very helpful both for this conservation management plan and a conservation management plan for uh, another building that we did in Yangon, which I'll also talk about. And actually the, the reason to talk about the conservation management plan is when we first started looking at this building, I was told that the building was a 19th century caravanserai. And it was actually through doing the conservation management plan um, and researching um, actually a, a, an academic paper that was put together a couple of years ago, we found out there was actually part of a 144, a network of 144 caravanserais that stretched across um, uh, Afghanistan. And there's actually a 17th century caravanserai um, and uh, represented a network that kind of was the intersection of the Safavid Empire and the Mughal Empire. You can see it there. So just in Bamiyan, kind of just north of Kabul. These just a couple of images to sort of give a little bit of a flavor, perhaps, um, again, taking the conservation management plan of how the space might have once been used. So on the top left hand side, that is um, these incredible uh, uh, vaulted um, halls. And then on the right hand side is actually an image from um, uh, uh, history of Islamic architecture, showing how the caravan surrise um, typically have been used. So you've got these sort of um, these raised platforms with uh, merchants resting. And then you've got kind of the animals adjacent to them. And then the bottom image is actually an image from uh, the caravan Sarai in Bamiyan uh, with a sort of photo superimposed on top of it, actually from uh, a, a caravan Sarai in Iraq in Fallujah, uh, but just gives a sort of a feel of how these spaces would have been used, how busy and hectic and alive they would have been with animals and um, produce um, and, uh, and wares to be traded and merchants. They were basically a, a similar to, our, I guess, a modern day kind of service station really. Uh, so they were uh, spaced at about 20 kilometers uh, distance, so a kind of a day's travel. And they were to provide safe haven, secure, um, secure accommodation for tra uh, traders, and they were really to facilitate overland trade. And this academic paper that I relied heavily on actually for my research um, was all done from uh, military satellite imagery. Um, and actually it was when I was just looking at this paper and then I just sort of recognized the footprint of the caravan Sarai, which actually is shown in A. And then I could actually identify that it was part of this network and therefore kind of date it back to the, this time. As I mentioned before, um, you've got these incredible uh, diagonal uh, vaulted earth bricks. So you've got Got a kind of a stone foundation, uh, the Paxa uh, wall, and then these vaulted uh, domes made out of mud brick on top. Again, uh, quite a lot of uh, research has been done into similar structures. So, um, what they're calling a diagonal groined vault. And you can show how it's constructed with no um, no need for temporary works or centering. It kind of gradually builds up into the center. We also did a 3D um, scan of the, uh, the project, which at the time um, it was quite isolated and quite uh, the security situation was actually probably worse back then um, in uh, 2020. So this really uh, created a really important um, source for us really to do all our work. Um, this is one of the outputs from the scan actually, where you can see it's kind of transparency mode. I I'm sure people are much more familiar with um, 3D scanning than I am, but um, it was super helpful for this because you can obviously, when you're doing a condition survey, you can see all the white areas, the areas where the vaults are um, intact and all the dark areas are where you're sort of scanning down to the, uh, the ground below and you can see where they've um, collapsed or been lost. And that's kind of zooming in so you can see, really see down to the level of the individual mud bricks, which is obviously, again, super helpful resource when you're doing a condition survey following any one site visit. And then this is just a brief fly through of the 3D scan. 
and there you can see the sort of the, the boundary walls which are made out of packs are incredibly defensive um, with the four towers which would contain these, car these caravans arise typically would have contained a garrison to defend them um, and then one entry point through the middle into these two courtyards one probably well, the, the southern courtyard which is really accommodation um, and has individual rooms little fireplaces and then the northern um, the northern uh, courtyard would have been for the animals and also storage of, of, of wares etc and there's a little mosque in the middle in the bottom you can sort of see almost like the melted nature of the um, the original earth fabric and obviously we say it's 17th century but clearly with earth buildings, they and particularly in the climate like in Bamiyan, where they have quite harsh winters, obviously there is a con constant erosion and repairing cycle that goes on. So, it'd be interesting to do some carbon dating to actually find out which which bits date from which areas, really. And um, we've been working uh, with Phil and Claire Bradley um, from Bath, um, who've been helping us out and actually working supporting us um, since uh, about 2016, when they first started working with us in, in Myanmar, actually. Um, and I worked with Phil and Claire Bradley back when I was working on the Middleport Pottery uh, po uh, project that Martin mentioned earlier. This is just a visualization of the Southern Courtyard. And thinking about um, this building project, uh, we were looking, we are looking at um, using um, the Northern Courtyard as a carpet weaving center carpet finishing um, and then the southern more as a kind of uh, visitor center but also a staff accommodation a bit of a heritage center and teaching space and as I mentioned before there's a mosque also in there so I'm going to uh, move from uh, Afghanistan to uh, so I'm just keeping an eye on the time uh, move from Afghanistan to uh, Myanmar um, so I went out to Myanmar at the end of 2014 uh, to set up the project there as country director and focused, uh, we were based in uh, Yangon, uh, the former capital of Myanmar, then Rangoon in the 1900s. And that's a, a historic map of the town, uh, the city, sorry, of, of Yangon, which was set out on a grid structure, the downtown. When we got there at the end of 2014, we partnered with a local engineer called the Yangon Heritage Trust. And it was really, Back then, uh, the country was opening up, there was investment coming in, and um, a lot of the historic buildings were under threat of demolition, really with an aspiration, like a lot of Southeast Asian cities, to, to modernize. Um, you think of the likes of, obviously, Hong Kong and Singapore um, and Bangkok. And this is the building that, uh, it was actually the third building that we restored, and, and the largest. So it's the, the white building in the right of, your, um, the, right of the picture just to the, uh, to the right of the Sule Pagoda. And the Sule Pagoda is a um, historic Buddhist um, pagoda that kind of marks the whole center point of the, uh, of the downtown. So the whole of the downtown was set out around that pagoda. So a really important location. And this is the building, as I say, the third building, the largest of the buildings that we worked on, the, um, the, what was then known as the um, Taurus Burma building. And this is before we started works on the building. It was actually designed by a relatively young um, uh, British architect called Thomas Swale, who then went on to um, do a lot of buildings in Melbourne and Australia. And this was the building during construction um, and came from the, uh, the archive of his granddaughter, actually, who keeps that in, in Melbourne. And you can see very similar, I guess, in terms of construction to pre-2000, uh, sorry, pre-1911, pre-Brits, basically, um, London uh, construction. So very similar to buildings before they became fully steel framed, uh, very similar to a number of buildings on, say, Regent Street. So uh, load-bearing masonry uh, outer with, um, uh, with a, a steel framed uh, inner. And this actually had um, filler joist, Hang on, let me remind myself. Yeah, filler joist floors in between. And it was originally built um, as the first Burmese-owned department store called the Burmese Favourite Company. It was quite badly damaged in the Second World War. And then eventually, this is from the 80s, being used as a tourist Burma building. Um, 
So we did a number of, uh, of workshops, did a lot of training alongside this project, a lot of engagement with um, the local, uh, local students and local um, young professionals. Again, conservation management plan, as I mentioned before, modeled on the uh, conservation management plan that James Simpson wrote for um, another building in Yangon called the Secretariat. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, uh, Field and Clegg Bradley um, provided uh, some invaluable support on the design side, as did Bureau Happold on the um, environmental side and Grand Associates on the um, uh, landscaping side. And quite a lot of challenges with um, uh, the climate in Yangon in terms of it's a tropical climate, um, incredibly uh, humid, warm, has uh, decays buildings pretty quickly. Um, so also thinking about the comfort and how the, how the building's gonna function is a key part of the, the project. And we were looking at securing public access to the, the majority, well, the most important parts of the building, which is the ground floor, huge, great, um, open space on the ground floor and also the, the roof garden, uh, sorry, the roof terrace that kind of overlooked the Sulu Pagoda. And they're looking at office space in the middle to help um, secure the economic future of the building. Um, alongside the, uh, the building works, we held a number of events. This is Peter Murray from um, New London Architecture. who was actually in Myanmar on a sponsored cycle ride with um, uh, Article 25. And he very kindly, um, popped in to uh, talk about uh, New London architecture and the, and the role that that has um, for the city of London. This is um, Philip Gaethje's uh, master plasterer from Lincolnshire who came out, as he first came out for our first project back in uh, July 2015, and then very kindly returned at the beginning of this project to really set up uh, the works on site and train the Corps of Masons as well as um, uh, Masons from further afield and really concentrating, these are some images on the, the, cleaning, of, uh, the cleaning of the facades and then the, the restoration of the, uh, the decorative elements. At the rear of the building, there was a, um, a standing seam copper roof, which had um, completely decayed. So we um, were just, um, again, putting that back there. And in the bottom left of the image is actually a machine that they built, um, well, they designed and commissioned and constructed from scratch to, to make the uh, effectively the copper cassettes and roll them into um, the desired shape. Incredibly skilled carpenters on site. Um, uh, the reason that the, uh, the British first went to, uh, well expanded from India into Myanmar was really for the Burmese teak. So there's a, a long legacy of highly skilled carpenters in the country. This is uh, lime washing the external of the building, pretty massive of that of uh, of lime wash uh, mixed up in bulk to try and um, ensure continuity of color across the whole of the, um, uh, of the facade. This is a cast iron um, spiral staircase, which we uh, cleaned up and restored on site. And also um, encaustic tiles that ran across the whole ground floor of the building, a massive expanse of encaustic tiles, which they're uh, being repaired there. Um, and this is, um, Paul Humphreys of um, Heron Humphreys, uh, who also came out, uh, kind of visited the project, um, stayed for a couple of weeks and helped with a lot of the, the finishing and the decorative finishing and also did a little bit of um, uh, gilding as well. And here he is um, uh, helping us uh, formulate the best finish for the, uh, for the, the teak floors, which was kind of a, a tongue oil, which is actually native to uh, Southeast Asia as well as China. It's actually called China oil locally. And this is the, um, uh, the, um, the workforce on any one day in Myanmar. Uh, sorry, on, on, on site in Yangon. And then just a few before and after images. So this was the, uh, the roof terrace that I talked about with the Sule Pagoda in the background, before and after. This was one of the main spaces in the ground floor um, before with the uh, uh, the, uh, the columns propped up and then after. And there are a couple of the original um, uh, adverts that have been, uh, were discovered during the cleaning of the, uh, uh, the, the later paint, of the paint, paint finishes. Um, so this relates to its time when it, was a, um, when it was a department store. So you've got the Dewar's white label whiskey, which still endures today. And uh, the rust and brown sherry, which I don't believe does. And then this is one of the, um, the upper floors that was turned into office space before and after. 
And this was the, the central space of the ground floor before and after. Um, and you can see there that we a lot of uh, energy and sort of time, and, and this was again with some support from Bureau Happel in the early days to really integrate modern services into the building without compromising some of the main spaces. So we actually introduced these lifts to give um, to access to the building. And a lot of the, uh, on the left-hand side of the picture, the, um, the, the services ran through a drop ceiling at the back of the building and enabled us to keep the, um, the main space that's clear of um, any uh, drop ceilings. And then just some images from the, the facades before and after, and then an overall before and after. Now I'm conscious that, actually no, I've got a little bit of time. I was gonna, there is a brief video, but I think probably we might come back to that at the end if, uh, if there's time. And you can just see in this image, the, um, uh, the Burmese favorite uh, text across the, um, across the facade, which was actually again uncovered, or at least the remnants of it were uncovered during the, the cleaning of those facades. And then this was the building finished. Um, this was an art exhibition that we uh, put in there of contemporary Myanmar art at the beginning. This is a pop-up restaurant that went in there. And then again, in Myanmar, as well as the, um, the built heritage, we were also working with traditional crafts. So this is um, backstrap weave weaving. Um, we work with, we're now actually working with uh, hundreds of backstrap weavers across the country, mostly from um, ethnic minority groups. And they have these traditions, um, incredible weaving traditions. So it's where, I don't know, um, well, the, the backstrap weaving is used when the, the, you use the back, you lean back into tension and you tie on one end and you're using your body effectively to, to tension the, um, uh, the loom as it is. And then you're weaving each, you can see there in the front picture, you're weaving each thread across and you're going up or down, which um, reveals the pattern. So it's obviously an incredibly uh, slow um, but skilled process. Um, and then this is uh, yeah, a craft fair that we did within the building. You can see here in the front of the picture, a slightly modern version, more modern version of hand weaving, which is on the frame loom. And also Myanmar, we um, has a, a strong um, tradition of goldsmithing. It's actually called, colloquially called the golden land. It's got a lot of golden gems. So we worked, um, we actually produce and work in um, fine uh, gold jewelry. And that's a, a range we've done for um, ethical jewelry, Pippa Small. And also incredible tradition of um, black aware in Myanmar as well, um, mostly up in Bagan. So we were, uh, some of the, um, we partnered with a, um, uh, a, a, a workshop there called Black Elephant, who've been producing incredibly fine um, black aware. And then this is just a, an image of the building uh, at night, primarily because Jeff Rich from Films Ed Bradley always tells me that buildings look best at night. So we'll start on that. Um, and I think it's probably important to acknowledge, um, I think uh, one, one of the, um, yeah, um, Turquoise Mountain works with heritage pre uh, preservation in conflict affected areas and clearly Myanmar is very much um, in the midst of that. This was from back in um, February uh, 2001 when the, um, the coup happened. That's, um, the protests which uh, swept across the city, the, um, uh, the tourist moment building in the background. I think, yeah, just as sort of a political point really, that um, this is uh, an image of uh, the tourist moment building in 1988, another huge um, political uprising back then. And because of its location at the center of, uh, of uh, Yangon, it is and has to, um, always been uh, in a very important location to the city and tends to be a, a place for um, yeah, political demonstration. And obviously COVID um, has affected Myanmar as well. Um, and this is actually the current use of the Taurus Burma building. Um, not quite what we originally had planned, but it is a COVID testing center. Um, so yeah, again, uh, similar, I guess, to uh, many countries across the world. And finally, um, I'm probably just gonna race, I'm conscious of time. I'm going to race through a little bit about our project in Jordan. Um, and this is our project of Amkais, which is up in the north of Jordan. Um, it's the decapolis city of Gadara, um, which is a, an ancient city, um, really at the crossroads, say at the crossroads of the, um, 
of the Levant, with views across Palestine, Jordan, Israel, Sea of Galilee, Lebanon, Syria, and the Golan Heights. And this is the remnants of actually a Byzantine church, which is on site. Um, and you can see from the map, it's right in the, uh, the north of Jordan, um, adjacent to the Syrian border. And the site with a, a pretty incredible history through from the ancient uh, city of Gadara, as I mentioned through, there was a big um, earthquake uh, which led to um, the abandonment of, uh, of the ancient city um, in uh, 1749. Um, and then it became uh, reoccupied again by the Ottomans. So it's got some incredible Ottoman ruins on it, as well as kind of more modern, um, modern remnants on site as well. In terms of being, it can be classified, it's next to a, uh, there's a new city, so, uh, sorry, a new town, the new town of Umkai. So basically in the 80s, um, the Jordanian government, um, as part of a sort of wider drive, um, actually rehoused all of the, um, the old families from the Ottoman um, town, which is built on the Acropolis of the, of the ancient city and put them into, uh, accommodated them in a new, uh, a new town adjacent to, to the um, archeological site. Uh, which, um, yeah, caused a number of issues, um, which we're still living with today, but um, it is it is what it is. But um, it does mean that it's characterized by this kind of archeological park, Oldham Kais, which is really Ottoman ruins set upon the Acropolis of ancient ruins. And then um, New Umkais, which is the new town. Uh, so this is, this is the view of the um, uh, the site from the air, and what you're really looking at the centre of the image there is the uh, the Ottoman remains on top of the Acropolis. And um, you can see the Western Theatre, perhaps in the uh, towards the right of that, uh, which is classical theatre, um, and then the archaeological park extends across to the right. And these are some images of the Ottoman era ruins, as well as the the classical ruins set within this incredible archaeological park and it's sort of a, a voyage of discovery you kind of stumble across these incredible uh, remains um, amongst set amongst these um, very beautiful olive groves with this incredible uh, backdrop and then this is the new town as I mentioned before the surrounding landscape and yeah we, this is for us um, as an organization this is really a this is a sustainable tourism project. There's a number of threats um, to the heritage here relating really to the loss of the urban fabric um, and the skills um, to maintain it um, and, and conserve it. Um, the disconnect between the community and the actual archeological site um, and, and the high unemployment um, uh, in the area. So really utilizing the sites, harnessing the sites to um, preserve it as a, uh, a site of international significance um, for the benefit of uh, well, the local community, national and international. Um, and yeah, really focusing across the regeneration of the heritage, the education and the uh, provision of jobs, like a lot of our projects. And Jordan is blessed with many um, incredible archeological and uh, historic sites. Um, obviously, uh, sites such as Petra and Wadi Rum and the Dead Sea are kind of the big um, highlights of people sort of visiting Jordan. But this is really focusing on the, the northern loop to so try to encourage um, uh, tourism within a, um, a collection of um, amazing sites within the north of Jordan. One of the things we're focusing on at the moment in, in the early days of the project is really the protection um, to the, the surroundings. I think what sets Umkais apart from a lot of sites in Jordan is the fact that it had set in this incredible um, backdrop of uh, natural heritage. And so really trying to protect that from the get go. So here you've got a picture from Jarash, which is a, a similar Decapolis city, um, about an hour and a half um, south of Umkais. We, here you can see that obviously um, the town is very much around the archeological site compared to one of the images I showed earlier of Umkais really highlighting its setting and the importance of that. So one thing we're working with the, um, the government at the moment, the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities is how we protect that by creating a buffer zone and then a wider development plan for the area. 
This was um, our founding patron, His Royal Highness, uh, visiting at the end of last year, walking down uh, the Decamanus um, uh, at Umkais. And this is an image uh, taken from, I think, in the late 90s, perhaps, when uh, the Western Theatre was um, excavated and then to a certain extent restored. And this is an image of uh, uh, the theatre at Jarash um, and the approach they've taken there, which is obviously to to bring the, the theatre back into use. We've done some work at the Western Theatre in terms of really simple work so far in terms of just um, trying to improve some of the, uh, the barriers there, uh, but it's very much a, uh, a used piece of um, uh, his, uh, well, historic archaeology. archaeology. Um, we put, we've just put a temporary stage back in there, trying to think about how it can um, start to be used again, but this is just the, the local community um, using uh, the site during sunset most days. Some kind of aspirational image for the future potentially. Um, and there are many other sites I could talk about on, on, on uh, I'm kind of conscious of time. Uh, so I'm gonna start wrapping up. Um, but uh, this is um, Her what's known as Heracles Baths, which is um, uh, contains these incredible mosaics not dissimilar to some of the mosaics recently discovered uh, by the Shard, I believe. I saw the images that came up and obviously very familiar. There's many of these across the site. And again, looking at how we can improve uh, the situation there at the moment they're exposed um, and how we can use it as a kind of a working archeological site, opening it up to visitors and but carefully managing people moving through the site. And then this is a, a, just a, an overview of the, um, uh, the, the, the Ottoman village within the, um, on top of the Acropolis, which obviously offers a bit more um, flexibility for creating some of the functions on site that are needed. We've already started some projects there, one with an existing courtyard, which actually has yet um, the, the remains of a Roman villa within the courtyard. So you can really sort of see that the Ottomans built very much on the template of the, um, of, of the Roman villas that were there before working and training up local stonemasons and looking at ways to sort of present and frame out some of the, the archaeological ruins within that. This is another project we're working on at the moment, um, again with Phil and Clegg Bradley, looking at um, bringing in some community tourism uses into one of the courtyard houses and really making the most of these incredible uh, topography across the site. And looking at the infrastructure, uh, this is actually a uh, uh, an artist's image of um, the Nymphaeum and just highlighting the importance of water and how important water was to the, uh, uh, the ancient city. It was actually one of the longest aqueducts in the ancient world that ran from Damascus all the way to Umkais and, and served all the decapolis cities. And the Nymphaeum was clearly their celebration of the fact that water was so important and they were bringing clean uh, drinking water to the city. And water remains an incredibly important resource for um, Jordan today. And then just um, uh, working with the um, landscape ar architects, Churchman, Thornhill and Finch, really acknowledging the importance of the landscape and how it's presented, looking at different ways in which it could be presented and looking at the, the, um, the landscape as a source of um, edible um, heritage and produce for, um, for tourists and for, to serve the, uh, well, to add to the offer, looking at climate appropriate planting, back to that point of um, the scarcity of water resources in Jordan, looking at kind of historic planting and then looking how we in can introduce craft into things like creating um, shade on site. So this is the basket weaving traditions of Omkais being sort of uh, thought about there. And that's um, that, sorry, it's a large long race through um, just finishing on an image. We're also working a lot with Syrian um, uh, uh, carpenters um, and this is actually from a um, uh, commission for that's going to go into Leighton House as part of its refurbishment opening I think later this year. So yes that's it from my side from the uh, uh, from the presentation side that's a bit of a whistle stop tour across some of our um, our projects in uh, Afghanistan, Myanmar and Jordan. Great, Harry. Thank you very much indeed. I feel quite breathless with the <laughs> scope of what you covered in the last three quarters of an hour. Um, I'm sorry you 
I had to go so fast, but yeah, for a couple of hours, quite happily, I think, as you explained uh, in even more detail. Um, but it's good to have the opportunity to ask some questions. And um, to all people attending, if you've got questions, please use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen to type in your question, and then um, they'll be selected and see what comes up. Um, going, uh, Harry, could you, could you just say a little bit more <clears throat> about Turquoise Mountain as an organisation and how actually you managed to integrate so successfully and apparently so swiftly into the uh, cultures that you, you, you know, you're embedded in? Uh, yeah, thanks, Martin. I mean, I think the yeah the the oldest projects and the largest projects is um, our project in Afghanistan, which we've been there since two thousand and six. Our second project actually was a project we started in um, in Myanmar in two thousand and fourteen, um, and and then Jordan followed on from that. So, yeah, I think probably our um, I think well if, to use the example of Afghanistan um, and Murudhani, it was really about the integration into a particular community in the old city. Um, and really focusing in on that and working across kind of, uh, I mean, to use a slightly naff term, but it's sort of an integrated development approach, really looking at sort of the needs of the community in terms of the, um, the, uh, the, um, the clinic and the school, but also then looking at this kind of cultural preservation um, in terms of intangible skills with the, uh, the Institute for African Arts, Arts, and Ar Ar Arts and Architecture. And then also working on the building. So kind of working across all those things, trying to integrate them, but doing it in quite a focused um, and a focused footprint. So uh, I guess sort of working across a lot of things, but in quite a focused footprint and not spreading ourselves too thinly. Um, and only now really uh, looking to expand uh, other places like Bamiyan and um, across the country. So I guess kind of having focus and the, the integrated sort of approach, I would say was quite key to what, we're, what we've done. Well, obviously, you're, you have great success in doing what you very observation skills. Um, how easy is it to find actual craftspeople? Um, have you had to um, uh, have you had to introduce um, craftspeople from you know Europe, uh, like you mentioned the plasterer from Lincoln and and um, the people from Heron Humphreys. Um, has that been a major part or do you manage to find many of your craftspeople and crafts actually locally in any case? Um, yeah, I think it's an interesting question. I think when, again, the approach of sort of starting a project, starting on site, doing training workshops and trying to get people um, out from the woodwork, um, no pun intended, um, and then just finding out what skills exist. And there, I mean, in all the places we work, there are incredible um, craft traditions, but also incredible levels of um, craft still being practiced. So it's not as if we're sort of training people from scratch and actually a large part of it is finding kind of existing masters within the countries we're working in and then um, helping structure that. I think the, the main um, value that's come from bringing in external uh, masters um, has really been around kind of structuring work and um, perhaps where, so in the case of uh, the Taurus Burma building in Myanmar, where kind of um, non-traditional method, well, non-traditional materials normally, so the obviously cement uh, starting to really sort of drift in and become uh, dominant. So thinking about taking things back a step really. So it's not really in terms of the skills, but normally the discipline or the materials and then um, uh, and then thinking about the approach on site and following a kind of a logical approach uh, to the work in terms of assessing what needs to be done. So it was, that's really the kind of the main value add that um, external people coming in have done. Um, uh, but I think in all the places we're working, the, the, the skill level is incredibly high um, mm. of the carpenters or the masons or the kind of those guys who are hand carving mud plaster in, in, in Afghanistan. They've got incredible um, natural skills. So. Um, I think it's kind of just bringing, as I say, bringing in those extra sort of finer points. Great, thank you very much. Well, questions are, are coming in thick and fast. Um, one from uh, James Grissom. Uh, can you please explain how the money works and the extent to which priorities are shaped around funders? Um, yeah, it's a good question. So I think, 
things have evolved over time. I think um, in the current, well, over the last, uh, how should we say, five years probably, um, I think there has been um, some specific donors who are interested in cultural heritage uh, preservation, particularly in conflict affected areas. So I think after what happened with ISIS in, um, uh, in Syria, I think there was a resurgence in interest in that. So um, the, the British Council had the uh, Cultural Protection Fund, which was very much set up because of that. So kind of um, heritage in, 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 in danger. There's a fund called Alif, which focuses on that. So I think within recent years, there has been a bit more of a trend towards um, focusing on cultural heritage preservation in conflict affected areas. But I think historically we've um, also uh, tied it into economic development. So um, uh, in Afghanistan, we've had a huge amount of funding from um, USID um, and that relates really towards uh, sustainable economic development. So particularly within the craft air, um, industry, looking at uh, uh, exports for carpets and how um, you can uh, kind of get uh, crafts into high-end um, international uh, luxury good markets and then um, utilize those incomes to, to to build kind of sustainable livelihoods for people. So it's kind of a bit of a mixture, a bit of a mix and a match across different kind of funded priorities. A number of people have, have raised questions um, really um, and being delighted by the noting the number of uh, women craft specialists both in Afghanistan and in Myanmar. Is that being in Afghanistan that must be now a problem? Is that being, I, I know that you, I mean, you had those um, shots of um, uh, school children uh, with a lot of um, girls that um, being um, educated. Yeah, I mean, I think we're yeah clearly since the change of government in um, in August, uh, there has been yeah quite a lot of concern. Um, I'm sort of happy to report, and as I say, I was there last week. Um, that uh, following well, we've yeah. So the the primary school is is um, our mixed classes, um, girls and boys educated alongside each other. They're actually after um, Nauru's, which is the end of this uh, month. We uh, are hoping, fingers crossed, that uh, the Institute will go back um, uh, full time for both male and female students as well. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, I think it's probably one of the biggest question marks um, following the um, uh, change in government. But I think to, to date, um, certainly things are uh, appear to be. Um, uh, yeah, better than we thought they might be, <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> and perhaps better than, than that is actually reported in the, in the international press as well. I think it's quite important to sort of, I mean, the, the, mm. it, yeah, I think clearly the narratives um, communicated internationally are always quite uh, simplified and polarized and clearly things are a bit more nuanced on the ground. But I think in, in short, the, um, uh, the say, should we say the modern Taliban government is, is a, a long way from the Taliban government of, that fell in 2001 that was destroying cultural heritage and obviously being um, incredibly oppressive to ethnic minorities and uh, women. So I think we're in a, a very different place than back then, fortunately. Um, and yeah, we're just sort of taking it kind of one step at a time. Still, it's great. I mean, it's great from our perspective to see so many women actually drawn towards craftsmanship because, um, you know, obviously we feel that um, uh, these skills can be practiced by anybody with the right interest and we would certainly want to you know further and support that um i i we have had a question in from jonathan brandt uh, about how your projects are selected um is um is turquoise mountain sort of invited to um uh look at certain projects or or do you actually sort of um, uh, observe where a, a project might usefully be done and suggest it to, to the uh, local authority? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think the original project, uh, we, so we were just a one country organisation for the first, uh, say, six, seven years of our existence. And that was Afghanistan. And that was really set up at the bequest of um, His Royal Highness Prince of Wales and the then president, um, um, I have a Karzai. And then um, we moved into Myanmar. Um, uh, again, 
sort of a mixture of invited by the Angle and Heritage Trust and a bit of interest from um, our royal patron as well. And then, um, and then the project in Jordan really came out uh, of the crisis in Syria and originally to work with Syrian refugees um, in Jordan and just kind of utilizing our experience across um, working in conflict affected areas with um, uh, heritage uh, preservation. So that's kind of, I mean, <laughs> to, I don't know whether that answers the question, but um, uh, I don't think we're sort of, we're not actively going out there looking for, uh, for projects. Um, some things come up and we sort of, uh, if they fit the mold, we will um, we kind of pursue them and uh, and uh, and if we can work effectively there, then um, yeah, we'll definitely great. Uh, I, I mean, is the Prince of Wales still actively involved? Uh, yes, he takes a keen interest in our work, for, for, uh, certainly. And obviously, uh, you saw, saw the images of him visiting um, Kais, um in in Jordan. Um, so yeah, he definitely takes a, a, a keen interest um, in in the, in the work of the of the charity. Great. And a question from Catherine Harrison. Um, are there examples of projects which had to be abandoned due to unforeseen circumstances, political upheaval, for instance, or extreme weather or reduced? <laughs> <laughs> um, good question. I would say we're pretty good on political upheaval, having got through a uh, pretty massive change of government in Afghanistan and a military coup in Myanmar um, and a, a global pandemic, which is also was uh, quite challenging. Um, yeah, so I think I think that's basically kind of our bread and butter, really. Um, resilience through those kind of things, and really uh, working pragmatically to try and um, uh, achieve our goals through those quite challenging, um, uh, those challenging moments. I mean, I guess environmentally, that's an interesting one. Um, actually, Yangon and Myanmar is one of the. I think, I think it's kind of top four in the um, most uh, environmentally vulnerable geographies in the world, um, which is kind of a mixture of where it is and kind of a risk of extreme weather, as well as kind of um, base levels of poverty. So, yeah, I think that's definitely something that's kind of um, very relevant moving forwards. I mean, I, it's always been something which I've been interested in and have noticed that, of course, T people take photographs, um, all, all of us take photographs, you know, when the sun is shining and the skies are blue, but actually when you see um, historic buildings that are most interesting uh, is when they are in the middle of a downpour or a hurricane, <laughs> and you then see what the kind of stress is that um, uh, buildings are under. And um, <clears throat> I mean, I noticed uh, thinking of your Afghanistani, um, uh, buildings, uh, you know, the, 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 mud the mud walls and things, that must um, take a terrible hammering when it snows and, and, um, and rains, which presumably it does from time to time. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think, um, so in Kabul, our kind of uh, annual um, maintenance is really around reapplying the top layer of um, of Cargill to the roofs to ensure that they continue to be watertight, clearing snow off flat roofs when it when it snows heavily, um, also re um, uh, reapplying the external plasterwork. So it is really a kind of a maintenance for an earth building, which is why I sort of said the the seventeenth century caravanserai in in uh, Bamiyan be interesting to sort of do an, an a cross sectional analysis of what dates from the seventeenth century and obviously later dates because clearly it's an ongoing um, uh, kind of maintenance and uh, and refurbishment job when it comes to an earth building. Another question from James Grayson. How scalable is Turquoise Mountain's work and how broadly do you anticipate it will be working in 20 years time? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think, as I say, I think there is, um, I think it raises quite a lot of interesting questions about kind of the role of um, cultural preservation, particularly in conflict affected areas. And as I said, this kind of culture of uh, of, I think there was a lot of a lot of publicity, particularly around um, ISIS um, and, and the need for cultural preservation in conflict affected areas. Um, I mean, obviously, sacking of historic sites is nothing new. It's been going on for um, centuries. Um, so, and, and sadly, I think it will probably continue to go on. Um, and sort of targeting people's cultural heritage as a kind of almost a weapon of war is um, sadly something that is still done. Um, uh, still done today so yeah I mean I think it's always going to be important I think it's important to I, I don't think we're ever going to be 
uh, working across all the conflict affected areas in the world uh, that's got got heritage. But I do think in terms of doing quite um, high profile projects that kind of really raise awareness um, and raise people's understanding of um, different cultures and um, and what they're going through, I think is is really important. So I think, yeah, I, I don't think we're ever going to be working um, across the whole world, but certainly focusing in on quite targeted uh, projects where we feel we can have a kind of tangible impact. There may be a bit to do in Af in um, uh, the Ukraine in due course. Who knows? Mm -hmm. um, question from Kibi Schaefer. Um, th the project in Jordan at Amkais seems hugely aspirational. Did you mention a time frame for it? And what, to what extent are you bound by uh, that kind of time frame? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, to our approach, and I guess perhaps relating back to the previous question, really, we, we tend to focus in on a, a project, an ambitious project, that we kind of stay the duration. I mean, I think due to many different reasons, I mean, obviously changing governments is one of them, but the instability of the areas that we're working in, um, it does take a long time to sort of get uh, to build up projects, gain leverage, and then continue to be able to operate them and successfully operate them and help them through. Uh, times of instability so I think our model really does involve kind of focusing in for the longer term uh, on projects so I think on Kais we sort of rather than a two to three year horizon we're looking at more like a 10 to 15 year horizon really so yeah a kind of a longer term thinking. Well even that sounds quite brief to me knowing, <laughs> knowing how long some of these projects take. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've had a question in from uh, Joshua Hill uh, which is a question very close to my own heart. Um, following on from your comment about building maintenance, do you have any reflections from your work on how this, this important preventative work can receive suitable support in comparison to transformative projects with clear visual outcomes? Yeah, that's no, a good point. I mean, I think, so uh, I guess Yangon is a very good example, incredibly um, harsh, uh, monsoons, um, huge problems with damp, uh, very humid, lots of corrosive uh, issues around the embedded steelwork, but also in terms of kind of like vegetation growth across facades, all those kind of things. So yes, in terms of the good old fashioned um, rainwater goods and maintenance and keep taking care of those, those kind of those kind of approaches were really important to our work in, in Yangon. And actually, again, before the military coup, we were working very closely with the regional government and then the, um, uh, the local government in terms of how they maintain buildings um, uh, and kind of, uh, and that was a key part of what we were looking at for the tourist Burma building really. So yeah, that's a key, a key thing. And as I mentioned in, um, in, in Kabul, uh, the kind of the annual maintenance cycle on an earth building is, is kind of fundamental. Um, and as soon as you stop maintaining them, they basically, for a better word, dissolve. So um, yeah, I think it's they're, they're very relevant uh, points there. And I think, um, yeah, something we did focus on a lot. And we did introduce the management and maintenance plan into uh, Yangon and the YCDC there. So yeah, it's definitely something we were um, acutely aware of. Well, it's, I mean, it's very good to see these um, disciplines, such as conservation plans and things, which we've become very um, familiar with in, over the last 20 years or so um, being, being uh, introduced. I mean, I noted that, you know, you, you obviously you're bringing in um, you know, Field and Clegg and um, indeed yourself and, and others from Europe with those kind of professional skills. Are, are you um, trying to train people locally with those kind of professional skills as well as the craft skills? Yeah, I think that's yeah, it's a good question. And again, to the to use the example of uh, in Yangon, we so during the, the project structure actually for the Torres Burma building was that we we worked with a local architecture practice um, called Statement Architects. Um, who were kind of mentored through us by Phil and Clegg Bradley. So they were kind of doing a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff. Um, so it was kind of, yeah, about building the capacity um, within the, the local um, professions and then also doing wider workshops. So we did everything from like kind of, con yeah, writing a conservation management plan. And quite often we had quite a lot of, uh, when we were doing wider um, kind of practical training, so it, whether it was around lime plaster or um, carpentry, uh, we would have quite a lot of professionals um, coming to those workshops as well. So that was great. So yeah, no, there definitely was a, a focus um, 
to try and develop that that kind of that skill. Great. Well, we ought to wrap up um, fairly soon. You've been very patient with us, but can we just take one or two more? Um, uh, the, the project in Jordan appears to involve a lot of rebuilding. Do, how does your training as an SBAB scholar influence your decision making on that? <laughs> I feel I got off quite lightly actually with uh, not so many uh, SBAB related um, uh, <laughs> questions. <laughs> I think it's, I mean, it's, yeah, Jordan is an interesting example because, as I showed with the Western theatre, um, a huge amount of kind of excavation and reconstruction was done in the past, um, which, for better or worse, kind of gives you a, uh, um, uh, a starting point. Um, I think, in terms of our approach, say, for the Western theatre, there are areas of it that have been heavily restored already, and there are areas that are kind of like almost like romantic ruins. So um, I think we're not looking to do a huge amount in addition to that, but sort of present that. And then also, I think it's important to sort of tell the story of why does it look like it does? What is the history? Who, what have people done in the past? And, and the quite recent past as well to sort of, um, to, show, uh, to show how it's got to where it is. Um, I think in terms of the Ottoman era um, uh, ruins, again, we are um, uh, looking at that very much in detail at the moment um, and parts of it and, and looking at that language of, showing what um, new interventions and making sure they're kind of distinguishable and honest and actually having that conversation and kind of definitely having that kind of debate with the local authorities so the kind of the, the, the department of antiquities there who may or may not always share those kind of views so sort of having that debate and and showing good examples and I think at the end of the day it kind of comes back down to Kind of core principles of quality of design, quality of intervention, uh, communication, um, and I think what's kind of different sometimes in some of the geographies we work is really bringing along um, the, the the local custodians of the heritage with you on those journeys and explaining, um, not being too uh, evangelical about uh, approaches, acknowledging kind of the balance of the need for um, skills preservation as well, um, and sort of. As as, a, as 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 everyone grapples with projects everywhere in the world, I guess. But I guess some of the um, some of the uh, issues are, um, I guess, a bit more uh, acute uh, uh, in in some of these areas where there isn't so much of the professional structures or even the uh, the kind of um, government oversight. So yeah, I guess uh, that's a rather long meandering right. answer. But <laughs> well, that's no, no. <laughs> It was a question tricky to answer. Um, just uh, one or two quickly that, that have just come in from Robert Morrissey. Um, will these projects eventually become self-propelled in terms of local vision, skills and economics, do you think? Yeah, again, I mean, that is always the, the dream. Um, uh, we do face setbacks. Um, I mean, I think when we started in Yangon, for instance, we had some very ambitious aspirations about, so I talked about the usage for that building, about the two middle floor plates being commercial office space, which would perhaps subsidize the um, uh, the kind of the running of the more public spaces and the ground floor and the roof. Now clearly since the Myanmar um, uh, coup, that um, has, uh, has not materialized. So I think, yeah, the, the aspirations are there and sometimes the political situation don't always allow for it. I think in Jordan um, where we're looking hopefully at a slightly more stable situation. Yeah, the at the core of what we're doing there as a sustainable urban um, a sustainable tourism project is really yeah to try and make sure that that the incomes from the, um, the increased tourism and the and the kind of the um, uh, the responsible um, use of the site going forwards kind of help to reinvest in the site and keep it going in the future without uh, the need for huge external capital investment so yeah that is definitely aspiration not always possible but <laughs> aspiration thank you um have you got the appetite for just one more um about documentation um yeah. uh, clive Baldwin was interested by your uh, laser scan of the caravanserai how much documentation and recording of projects is conducted prior to intervention and if so where is the information archived for potential study later yeah, it's a good question. So to use the example of the um, caravan, so right, we haven't started on site there. So I would say that was on the um, uh, the better side of uh, pre-documentation, as in we did a full 3D scan, which I have to say for um, 
a kind of uh, a ruin of a earth building is an incredibly useful thing to have, as I showed, I think I tried to show through that and uh, sort of a new dimension, given that those buildings are kind of so almost organic looking in their in their form and to be able to record that down to the accuracy that you get from the 3D scan is pretty amazing. Um, and obviously the exercise of writing the conservation management plan for that um, unearthed a huge amount about the history of the building we didn't previously know. So. And we haven't started on site and we hope to start on site on that building this year. So I think that's kind of um, uh, a good example of where, well, I mean, obviously, I, I, don't, I imagine most people on this call understand the importance of, uh, <laughs> of recording um, of, of recording buildings. Um, but really, I guess, in terms of showing people the value of doing it in a very pragmatic way, I think that's a really, it's been a really useful exercise in terms of how we, um, a lot of that work was uh, funded by the British Council. So a lot of, um, uh, the output then goes um, uh, into uh, information and archives that they hold, as well as ourselves. We hold everything. And again, <laughs> um, following, again, given the, the political uh, dynamics of areas that we work in, we are quite conscious about what information we hold where um, and how we back information up. So rest assured that those that information is is well stored and we are actually looking again sort of more driven by covid um looking about uh looking at kind of education platforms about how we can get more things online i think like a lot of people a lot of organizations how we can get stuff online how we can curate it um i think we're interested in rather than kind of archiving stuff really how we bring it to public attention and we create it in a way that's kind of accessible to lots of people and and present in a kind of educational form um so yeah i guess again a long rambling answer but um <laughs> it is something that we're definitely working to well thank you harry i mean it's quarter past eight and you've been very patient with us and uh, i think we ought to to wrap up um but actually um you've raised so many interesting topics and questions that we probably want to have you back again in a in a little bit and to, to do another. Um, and I hope that we and, and this kind of webinar can be, if you like, some part of that process of actually getting you know the message out there. Um, but anyway, thank you very much indeed. Wonderful presentation. I hope everybody's enjoyed it as much as I. It's sad that we have to do this online and that we can't all applaud, um, as I'm sure we would like to do. Um, but I've enjoyed it very much, and I hope you have all enjoyed uh, tonight's talk as much as I have. Um, so thank you, Harry. Uh, when the Zoom screen closes, you'll be asked to participate in a short feedback survey. Well, we've tried to keep it brief, and we do appreciate that everyone's bombarded with these wretched surveys these days but please do take time to complete it it should only take a couple of minutes and we do use the feedback to guide future events and it's uh, incredibly helpful so please don't just dismiss it um, i'd also like to use this opportunity to invite uh, people who are not yet members or are not members uh, of yccc to join as members we welcome supporters as well as practitioner members and you can sign up via our website where you will also find more details about the benefits of membership we hope we can you can join us for our next talk which will be in may where we're missing april um, for various reasons but we are um, going to have our next webinar in may so do check out our website for details thanks again to everybody to all our to uh, everybody who's taken part. Thank you, Harry, very much for your um, fascinating talk. Thank you all for watching and good night. <laughs>